but uh, the point of it is to reach out as many students as possible. And as we're a community school, that's going to be online. Um, also, I want to keep uh, keep in mind this event is not so much about debating ideas, but letting the students know what you're about, what your policies are, what you want to advocate for. So try and keep that in mind as we're going. Uh, because we're on such a short, there's so many candidates here, and we're on such a short um, time frame. Try and keep uh, what you're going to say just about you and what you want to get for. And with that in mind, I will let Simon and Jeremy take it away. Well, we also want to thank the SGTSAC election team, Chad, Joey, and the other Chad. Uh, you guys did an amazing job planning this event and organizing the student elections. I know that's not an easy task to do, and we appreciate all the hard work that you guys have done. So if we could just give a round of applause for that, guys. So I appreciate all of you guys' work. All right, so as we get started, we're going to some ground rules. So again, as uh, Chad said, let's be respectful and be open-minded and letting uh, everyone speak their voice. Um, so we're going up there to speak. You're going to be directing your answers and responses to the audience and the market. So you shouldn't be looking at your other candidates and directing them in a heavy way. So we just want to make it productive, accountable, or uncomfortable. Um, so some rules of procedure, we'll be directing the questions to all the candidates, and you guys will give me a minute to respond to each of us. Uh, please respect the time limits given because this is meant to have everybody else having a, an opportunity to talk. There will be a timekeeper done by our friend Taylor over here. He will give you guys two separate warnings. One, to let you know that you are halfway through your time, and two, to end your time and your responses right there. Uh, for those of you that will not obey those rules, you will be given three different warnings, and then after that third warning, we will not call on you for further participation. All right, so same thing, uh, just all candidates will add here to the MSU Denver Shoot Code of Conduct. So, feel like you so we all answer. Um, yeah, you are not clear on your mind. You might have to switch it out. It's not. Oh, it's not going to. Yeah. Hold on now. First, that's true. Yeah, I'll bring it closer. So, um, yeah, so just to reiterate, uh, all candidates have to add here to the MSU Denver Shoot Code of Conduct. Yeah, I'll speak. Not really. So they go to conduct. Are you familiar with that, John? The code of conduct. No. Okay. So we can get you a copy of that. But basically, all the students have to sign it. Let's say enroll to MC Denver. It has so many rules as well. Basically, just be respectful. We're not here to debate or you know call anybody out in any sort of way. Um, it's just basically being respectful. Again, don't slander anybody. Don't you know make fun of anybody. None of that stuff. We're not going to make it back. And it will immediately be shut down if anybody starts to act up in that way. So just so you guys are aware. All right, cool. So the way we're going to start off with this is that we're going to give each candidate two minutes for an opening statement. Um, in your opening statement, introduce yourselves and explain your intent to run and why you, or what you think is the best thing about being an university member student. Um, so the first one will lose. We do. So we're um, going to begin in a two minute opening statement. You're going to come up here. So we got Matthew. So mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So it's going to be your name, pronouns. Sorry, excuse me, got my own card. Um, name, pronouns, your major, and why do you want to run? All right. And anything else? All right. Hi, my name is Matthew Rathbun. I'm a master of social work student here at MSU Denver. I'm also an alumni. Um, I graduate here, in my undergrad in human services. Um, my intent to run is to. Um, Bring more awareness to neurodiverse uh, populations and students on campus, increase access to resources. And personally, I plan on going into macro level social work. So I also want to take my experience here um, to eventually even intern at the Capitol in my concentration or my program. Um, and again, just trying to get access for students for resources, um, bringing diverse populations to the table versus just saying, hey, we want to hear from you. And yeah. Thank you. All right, next up, Jacob. Hello, my name is Jacob Marshall. I'm a uh, 
political science major at MSU. Um, I'm a first generation working class student, so I mean, my whole focus is putting the, the power of student government back with the students, supplying them with more resources like school supplies, more funding for the uh, food pantry uh, around its corner, which I'm also uh, a worker at, um, and just making this campus a better place for, for everyone, make it easier for people to uh, focus on their, on their studies, which uh, it's hard to do when this is a commuting campus. A lot of our, our uh, students are working class, up to like 30% are facing food insecurity, so I'd like to knock down those barriers that are stopping people from graduating. Hi everybody, my name is Mike Warner. Um, my pronouns are he, him, is. I'm an accounting student here. Um, a few things about me, um, I identify as Mexican American and I am queer as well. So um, I'm rerunning for student government this year because I, in my travels through the campus, um, students are not being heard. The administration, uh, the tri-institutional um, kind of voice is not being heard between uh, administration, faculty, and students. Um, I believe fully that if we empower our student body here on this campus, then they'll lead to better retention rates um, and it will fully activate this campus more because I don't believe higher education has fully recovered from uh, the COVID pandemic and I'm running to increase um, spaces for students in this Tivoli building, I'm running to increase funding for students in this Tivoli building, and I'm running to um, just represent the students here next week. Denver. So thank you so much. Um, Hello, everybody. OK, my name is Gabe Trujillo. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am a psych major with a Spanish translation minor. Awesome. So, OK, cool. I am running again for student government because, one, I am an immigrant student. And I think that the university needs to do more than just write letters of support uh, for DACA. Right. If a university says that it's here for our students, then where's the action? Where, where where's that follow through? Where is more of that re actionable steps that we can see? And for that, I really want to push for more internships for our for our undocumented students, specifically those like me who do not have work authorization, and so therefore are blocked from a lot of other internship opportunities that others have. And the university needs to do something to really help push for that. And I also think with that, I want to really push for institution, permanent institutional funding for the Rowdy's Corner Food Pantry. Because again, if the university says it's here for its students, the university claims that it's here for to protect us and help us and find us and find us all these resources, then we need to see that actionable steps. And we as students are here to help hold them accountable. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone, excuse my mask. I had COVID last week, so I just want to keep everyone safe. Um, my name is Ree Varco. I am a graduate student and I'm getting my Master of Science in Clinical Behavioral Health with an emphasis in addiction counseling. It's been really important and an honor to be a member of TSAC over the last year because I've made so many inroads, I feel with different departments here at the university. One of the great things that the group before us, before our year instigated, was for our membership to really be involved on the university committees and councils. So we know what's happening at the university. So we can give student feedback and we can give students the information that's happening that the, that the university is planning. So having been involved in some of those, like the uh, student faculty, um, uh, committee, which is great, it feeds straight into faculty senate, and also with the university policy council. It's just there's a, some things that I want to continue to work on in the coming year. I hope you'll give me the chance to do that because being there for undergraduate students, both of my sons are undergrad students, and as a graduate student, getting more support for us graduate students, I think is really important for the best outcome for the whole university. Thanks a lot. 
Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking every single one of you for coming here today. And uh, I'm William Coates, and I'm running as a Latino veteran student. And I, this is my first semester, and I've seen some issues that I really want to change and be part of that change. And some things that uh, I've heard from students personally is uh, high cost for textbooks. And there's something called ORE, Open Education Resource. That's something that I'm trying to implement throughout all the departments. I know some departments currently have them. And honestly, if we could save a few hundred dollars every semester for all students throughout MSU, that'd be fantastic. Because I know everyone's struggling during these hard times, and I'd like to be able to help students that way. Another thing I'm running for is a safer campus for everyone, because every student deserves to be uh, safe and feel safe when they go and uh, learn, pursue their dreams. And the last thing is veteran and minority representation is extremely important. Currently, right now on the council, there's only two veterans, and they're going to step down soon. And as a veteran, the only veteran running, I think it's very important for the veteran uh, students at MSU, which has the highest veteran student populace throughout the three universities here, that someone is there to voice their concerns. So, thank you, everyone. Well, uh, next up is Paul. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Nelson, pronouns he, him. I'm a communications student for now, the might change. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to be an MSU student and be running for student government again. Uh, the focus of my campaign is getting to the basics of what presents, prevents students from succeeding here at MSU. Oftentimes, that can be an empty stomach. When I first went to MSU in 2017, I dropped out in no small part because of food insecurity, because of financial insecurity. Food insecurity isn't a normal thing. It's not a natural thing that one in three students on our campus goes hungry or food insecure. This is a problem that can be solved with serious institutional skin in the game. I stand with my other candidates on this, on the, on this race in wanting to meet that challenge head on and eliminate food insecurity on our campus. A uh, big part of that is finding Roadrunner's Pantry or food, uh, Roadrunner's Rowdy's Corner. You have to excuse me, all the name changes. Um, so that's a big priority for me. Uh, I think that that lies at the root of why a lot of students might drop out of MSU. Um, and I think that if we get back to those kind of basics, uh, like food security, affordability of textbooks and school supplies, we can see a dramatic shift in the amount of students that graduate and are retained by our, by our institution here. I'm an activist and an organizer. I know many of you have seen me out there. Uh, I struggle for justice, and I think that that needs to happen at every level of power in our institution. And a big part of that is having student voice there. In the 1960s, it was the Metro State College that fought for and won a seat on the Auraria Board of Directors. I'm proud to be one of their predecessors at this point. Now, it's not over with, though. That is a voice without a vote. And I think that if it can be won by a student government, it can be expanded by a student government, and a vote can be won by that student government. The Auraria Board of Directors ought to have genuine student voice and vote on it, not just advising, but actual role and say. We talk about shared governance a lot on the campus, but we need to actually make it. Thank you, Paul. And next up to the comments. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, can you hear me now? Beautiful. I guess I'm holding it. Uh, so I am uh, Thomas Cheney, pronouns he, they, and uh, I am a communications major uh, going into my junior year. Also an organizer on this campus. I organize for the Aurora Across Disability Alliance, um, and I work with our, uh, our faculty unions on campus. Um, I am uh, I'm running specifically because I've been acknowledging the efforts from uh, from council members from the previous year to accommodate our uh, our students as we go into our uh, academic lives. Accommodations specifically for the working class citizens that are a part of our campus. Our campus uh, has a majority of people who are working full time on top of uh, pursuing their academic careers. 
These are people with families, with children. These are people with uh, aspirations outside of work and outside of school. And uh, I was inspired by no small part by efforts like the food pantry, by the free school supplies, by uh, the free RTD pass, all things that need to be protected under uh, progressive candidates. It's why I move forward with this and why I specifically align my campaign with Jacob Marshall and Paul Nelson, because something can be done when we all work for a better future. So I am excited to be running for student uh, government again. I really like to advocate specifically for indigenous peoples, BIPOC individuals. We claim to be an MSI institution, but yet we have very little representation for each of the cultures that we represent here on campus. And I feel like that's very disappointing. So I like to provide as much accessibility to I would like to provide and try to provide as often as I can as much accessibility to the resources that are available, especially for our STEM students and any other department as well. Uh, I think that indigenous culture specifically, we are very, very underrepresented along with our American African American cultures um, and our Middle Easterns as well. So if I can, I would love to do events and stuff consider or centralized around those cultures so we can get more representation on campus for them because they deserve a place here on this campus as well when it's a predominantly white institution. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm here because. There you go. Uh, I'm here because I know MSU got in, since 2020, MSU has got almost $3 million for being a Hispanic serving institution. And I would like to see what the money is um, I would like to tighten it, uh, student council with fac the faculty union. Um, nobody knows what we need in the classroom but us and the professors in the classroom with us. Um, I think we need to empower students as academics, not just as students. And, you know, uh, prepare them to go fulfill the workforce, but also we need to tell students that their positions as academics count. Um, I want to empower that identity. And yeah, I just, I would like to have a, a good connection between faculty, the board, and, and students. I know that's a hard and it's a complex relationship, but there's power numbers. Thank you. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, 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 I'm completely confident with myself. Do, 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 do. I see no approval from nobody else. I say, miss me with that. Miss me with that. I am 56 years young, and my name is John Nelson. I'm a non-traditional student, and I'm the new face of color, folks. My uh, agenda is authenticity and transparency. I say less and do more. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> So next up is me. I love that, by the way. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Jones. He, him, his. Um, I am a political science major, minoring in nonprofit studies. The reason I am here at this platform today is because these opportunities, these situations need to happen more frequently on campus. We need to get more students involved and we need the representation to be as equally involved. And that is something in an area that we're lacking in. Yes, we need more accessibility. Yes, we need more programs. Yes, we need all of these things. But if we have existing programs that aren't necessarily servicing students, what are we doing this for? I've heard a lot from the time I've been running from people and students on campus and individuals saying, hey, what is TSEC? What do you do? That's an issue. And that's an issue that starts here right now. 
I am the candidate of action. I am the candidate who is willing to get out, shake hands, meet people, get to understand individuals, processes, and activities that are happening on campus because we need more action. We could say all day, yes, we're the people with the action. Yes, we have these plans. Yes, we could do whatever. But without the action behind the words, what are we doing? Thank you. Nina. Guys, for not talking or understanding, getting to know my other roommates. And I honestly just forgot the name. Nathaniel. The name is Nathaniel. Yes. Awesome. I'm sorry for not understanding that before. And your name is Will. Oh. Cool. And your name is? Naomi. Naomi. Oh, yeah. Naomi. Um, and your name? Benny? Benny? Demi? Demi? And Mike? And Gabe? Reed? Reed? Paul? Paul? Tom? Jacob? Matthew? Yeah. And John? I appreciate all of my mates and I believe that they all deserve the position. I think that. Um, Indigenous reparations is extremely important, and I'm currently trying to hold an event called Reparations in Language Arts. And it's going to feature Ms. Thaha Coalition and Hasira Aisho Shemi. And I hope you guys make it. Everyone, you going to hold up? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to start our town hall forum. Our topics of discussion are going to be campus policing, campus safety, housing issues, and student, and student services. I have a few questions for you guys. All right. So thank you, candidates, for your opening responses. I really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, just a quick reminder, do not respond to each other. Your responses are only towards the moderators and the audience members. Um, Candidates are encouraged to raise their hand once I ask a question if they would like to answer that question. Not all candidates will answer the same question, but you will all get an opportunity to answer one within the uh, specific categories as well, too. So everyone will get an opportunity to do that. Just make sure that, you know, if you're over in Salis or you're not participating, I will be calling them or not calling them. So the same on All right, guys. So our first set of questions is really just to get to know you guys more as people and on a personal level. And to get you guys a little warmed up for, you know, this Q&A panel, which you know what's going to be. So the first question is, what is a good book you've recently read and would recommend if you don't have a book suggestion, because none of us have great time to read? Um, what about podcast or TV series? So, important. so John, Paul, Will, Danny? Yeah, okay. okay, the book that I... Okay. Oh, I was like, no, I'm so mad. <laughs> Okay, the book I read is The Four Agreements, and it's by Don Raguel Ruiz. It says, don't take anything personally. What others say and do is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. When you are immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be the victim of neither suffering. That's just one of the four agreements. And what was the other question about the TV show, was it? If you didn't have a book, you can recommend a TV show or a podcast. Oh, Louise Hay, you can heal your life. Thank you, right. I'm not finished with it quite yet. I it is a it is a great book, but it is a difficult one. Uh, so don't take it lightly. Um, I'd recommend Medical Apartheid. Uh, I as re, as I'm reading, I have to set it down. It's a very heavy book. It discusses the history of uh, essentially like a two tiered healthcare system that we've had in this country and how it's affected African American women primarily. Um, Basically, one of the biggest takeaways, you know, we all hear about the Tuskegee experiment and that, that book highlights the fact that that's just one sliver out of a long and horrible history of how this country is treated by women. Uh, I would, especially if you're going into medicine, I would, this is a mandatory reading, you know, uh, pick it up, listen to an audiobook version of it. There's free ones online. Uh, would recommend. <laughs> Well, hello. Um, there's this uh, one book called The Stranger by Alfred Camus. Is that right, Chad? Did I get that? 
Okay. <laughs> He's a philosophy guy. So am I. I love philosophy. And basically, it um, it revolves around nihilism and ex existentialism. So it's different ways of seeing how the universe operates and how it exists. And I think it's a very interesting read if you want to look at life in a different lens than what society has uh, given to you or imparted on you. So it's a very interesting read. I definitely recommend it. 10 out of 10. Um, a show that I would recommend that I just started watching. I've been been, been binge watching uh, HBO's Last of Us. I don't know if I have any gamers in here, but it's a great show. I definitely recommend it. 10 out of 10. So, yeah. Thank you, Will. Okay, I mean. to recommend is uh, decolonization of methodologies by Linda Smith and it's basically about how you're decolonizing the methods in which we do research and how research is technically a it's like a bad word to indigenous people right because everything that we do now is actually robbed of indigenous peoples everything that we call research is actually the methods of indigenous peoples around the world and what they've already put in place. And we just decided to put some fancy westernized term on it in order for us to understand and call it data. Um, to sum it up. And I haven't quite finished the book yet. I'm on the last couple chapters. And the show I would recommend is The Last Tourist. It really helps you become more mindful about how you travel and what you leave behind when you travel and the kind of things that you are investing in when you travel. So instead of a corporation, invest in a local business when you go somewhere and don't invest into the corporational um, parts of the traveling itself. Uh, okay. Thank you, Harold. All right, moving on to the next question. So I know like many of you already talked about your major, but tell us more about it. What made you want to pursue it? What are you passionate about it? Let's start from this side this time. Yeah, of course. Tell us more about your major and why are you passionate about it? What made you want to pursue your major or minor? Let's start from um, um, yeah. 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 Let's just go down the road some more. Right. Uh, let's go down. Let's start. Uh, so I didn't mention this, but I, so I am a biology major with a minor in a geographic information systems. Uh, the position and role that I want to take going into my PhD program will be um, studies of indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, also known as TEK. Um, I want to be able to use map making data gathering skills to basically um, compare and analyze areas that have been consulted by indigenous peoples to show them to support the fact that we know the land best and can help in land sustainability, land management, conservation, and then basically give, basically give our people, indigenous peoples around the world, a seat back at the table when it comes to managing the land and uh, just making sure that it thrives in all areas. So I have a land back tattoo from my numbers because we gonna get land back. <laughs> so once again, I'm Nathaniel Jones. My major here at MSU is political science. My minor is nonprofit studies. I currently run a small social entrepreneurship called Access America, where I help essentially provide homeless intervention, rental assistance, utility assistance to families and individuals within the Arapahoe County, Denver County, and um, Colorado Springs. Sorry, that was on the tip of my tongue. The reason I am passionate about what I do, my family comes from a long history of politics. I have an older sister who was the mayor of St. Louis. I have an older brother who was the mayor of Belleville Village in St. Louis. Going into the political science room is major for me. Um, I believe that change hope, passion, drive, accountability starts with those that we place in office. And if we are able to enact people that are legitimate, people that stand for what we stand for, even if it's just a small sliver of what we stand for, that's some type of change. That's the change that I'm hoping to drive in my future career, not only here at MSU, but hopefully later in Congress. Thank you. So basically when I started out, um, I was young. I didn't know what to do after graduating high school. 
but I always knew I loved history, you know, ever since I saw that uh, Alexander the Great movie on the silver screen, I was just captivated by, by it, you know, I was like, man, the, the long hair, the campaigning, the, doing the craziest things throughout history, right? So I always knew I wanted to do history, but like, after graduating from East High School, I didn't know what to do, so I went into the Marine Corps, and after some time, I became an instructor. And I found a, a passion in teaching people, you know, seeing them retain information, you know, being able to use it. And so what do I do? Just combine history with instruction, right? What does that give you? A history teacher. I just want to make sure that history doesn't repeat itself, right? Only the negative things that humankind has done to each other. I don't want to see that happen. So. That's that's why I'm studying this thing. Thank you. I decided to learn to do science. I moved here when I was 15 years so. old. I run from the drugs, uh, the war on drugs at that time. Sucks, but it was being in the States, thinking being in safety definitely gave me the opportunity to curious about what was happening in my country and what was happening here, you know, what's applying the demand, what's applying the supply. And um, I realized that there is nothing more vulnerable than learn, being in an unlearning environment. Um, so I decided to go into education for a while. I was in Para for a little bit. Um, so my goal is to finish my political science degree go into an alternative pathway to education, and then I want to practice education. Uh, we've been robbed of people, uh, people of color and, and bodies of color are disposable and I, you know, we're just expenditures. I just want to Hello, friends. Uh, I'm Mike Warren once again, um, and I'm an accounting major. And the reason I'm an accounting major is kind of a, a cool story because I started working with my dad when I was 13. Um, we owned a small business in a small town um, about two hours up north from here. And um, just having the experience of working with my dad, seeing kind of the, the small work that we did, um, inspired me to kind of uh, learn about money. I mean, I can count money as just fast as you can. Um, I love um, just interacting with the community uh, like we did, and uh, what I ideally want to do uh, is um, take that kind of that small town feel and um, go into the government and tackle white collar crime. That's kind of been my passion. That's what I want to do as a captain. So, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so I'm a psych major for a variety of reasons. One. I think the field itself needs to be more diverse, right? Like psychology was founded on the basis of whiteness. That's just how it is, right? And I really want to be able to go and push against those barriers because why are we comparing ourselves to what white men think is good? You know, 100%. Then also it's really interesting to learn how people work and how their stories and how their beliefs and everything impacts who they are. And I think that psychology is a great field to understand that. And I'm going to Spanish translation and I'm getting the Spanish translation certificate because I think translators need to be better at realizing that uh, getting things from one language to another is not just enough, but you have to also have to translate the meaning and the culture behind it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I want to apologize because I didn't send my pronouns last time because she heard and hers. Secondly, I just want to say it's always a privilege to follow Gabe because he's so full of joy and sunshine. Just lightens up the day. Um, I decided many years ago, um, I got my undergraduate degree before just about everybody in this room was born in journalism. And during COVID, I was really touched by the news stories of so many people who needed mental health counseling that I decided at my ripe old age to go back to school. And um, I have been here and been just overjoyed at what I've learned, at the people I've met, and how I've been moved to want to do more and more. And I think that's why with my degree in mental health counseling, I will really work with marginalized groups. But while I'm here at school, I've got two more years to go. I really want to see how I can be of use for this campus. But thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
I first studied computer science because I was told that's how you can make the most money. I was silly and naive at that time. Uh, after dropping out, I worked for many years uh, between then and now uh, in exploitative jobs, jobs where you work long hours over time for not enough money, uh, poverty wages. You know, I've had ramen for dinner, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, through that struggle, I learned the importance of collective organizing with your coworkers and union organizing. And I fought and struggled for two unions. I've had a lot of I've had a lot of failures along the way, but I've learned a lot from that struggle. And so I came back to school to study communication so I can become a more persuasive rhetorician, you know, for communication majors, persuasive speaking. Um, and really, so that's I get back on the shop floor and organize with my fellow workers for shorter hours, better pay, safer working conditions. It's that simple. I don't have high aspirations once I get out of here. I want to go back to the shop floor. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. So uh, I am a communications major, mainly because I started off as an entrepreneurship major, then eventually a marketing major, then finally communications. The reality is that my dad is also a, a communications major. Uh, it's something that just flows through my family. It's our, uh, our need to communicate with other people. And it's our first line of defense for uh, for protecting rights, for protect, for fighting for rights, for fighting for for equality. Is communication? It's the first thing that you say. No means no. Um, so, and it's a it's a powerful tool to be used. Uh, I'm uh, I'm testifying tomorrow to uh, to pass a, a statewide equal bill as we have seen like fights. To uh, to get that removed from a federally backed position, and I I do know that I uh, I'm sitting here as a white man talking about indigenous things. I wanted to also use that as an opportunity to give that to to our other candidates if they wish. Thank you, Tom. This is Jacob. Yeah, I'm Jacob. I'm uh, majoring in political science and uh, gender, women, and sexuality studies. I uh, first got interested in uh, politics in 2020. I think a lot of people started being coming politically activated then. Uh, participated in pretty much all of the uh, George Floyd uprising protests. Was out there striking with Starbucks workers when they were unionizing and the King Supers workers when they were unionizing. And I as many protests and uh, and strikes as I could since then, and uh, yeah, I want to learn more about uh, building the change on the ground, being part of the uh, progressive movement in this country, and uh, pushing things forward. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Matthew Athlon. He him his. Um, again, I'm alumni here from MSU. I got my degree in human services. Concentration high risk youth and a minor in gender and sexualities. I'm back for my master's in social work, looking at macro level social work, which is policy and legislative advocacy. Um, and I've worked in a lot of different organizations between um, Cloud Youth Matter, which worked around youth sexual health, uh, One Colorado, which is the state's largest LGBTQ plus advocacy organization. And I'm currently working with um, behavioral health providers and Medicaid to advocate for policy and legislative change and working also uh, with the student care center as a peer mentor for students on grammar assistance programs. And I've just always wanted to kind of use the power and privilege that is given to me because again, I'm the white guy in the room to carve the space to bring other people to the table to give them their voice and step back. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a disabled student to an extent. Uh, I have some mental disabilities at some point in time, and that. Um, but I also don't, but I do. And I believe that um, we need to. The reason why I want to go for a state cap position is because I want to talk to AHEC about more sustainable solutions and indigenous solutions and to see who they are as people, who's in charge. And I want to talk about putting house plants in the classrooms. I want to talk about moss growing on in concrete and so on. Um, oh, that's what it is. 
completely. Um, I I believe um, the first things that I'm going to do is try to bring the understandings of cheaper parking, houseless new students, and, and I support um, the rowdy, keeping rowdy, uh, the, the greening our environment, indigenous reparations, those are the main things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last but not least. Okay, here we go. I am inspiration manifested in the flesh. False evidence appearing real. That's not my deal. False evidence appearing real. Doubt just really get out of my mouth. I bring inspiration to the table. Keep job thinking candidates for all of your guys' responses. All right, so last question within the topic. Who would you consider to be your most influential role model or mentor and why? Go ahead, John. Take the microphone. Oh. Well, my inspirational role model is my late mother, Doris Jean Danvers. She taught me the power of authenticity. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be dynamic how I am today. And I use affirmations like, I am gentle with myself and I'm gentle with others. Thank you. Say my biggest uh, role model was one of my high school teachers, Steve Lash. Um, he got me in, interested in history and, and teaching and things like that, um, and learning about the world um, in a way that I didn't really have before. Uh, and now he is uh, the union rep for the school district that I was part of. So he's uh, doing the labor movement thing now, which I'm also very excited about. There's been a lot, but I'll just think of one of the more recent ones that in my life was uh, Black Panther Kwame Ture. Honestly, watching his lectures is like electricity for me. Um, he taught me that as a as a student, as a conscious student that understands the history, understands the present situation, that we have a responsibility to make change, and that it ain't easy. You know, you know that kind of change doesn't come easy. You actually have to struggle for it. He says we have to come with love the struggle, and so I seek out. I seek out the hard fights, honestly, uh, you know, and the kind of things I was talking about earlier are going to be easy to win. And I don't anticipate that to be, but I plan to undertake that battle uh, and learn a lot along the way. Um, and that as conscious students, we have a responsibility to fight for change and to fight for emancipation from exploitation. And, uh, you know, 80% of our students here at MSU are working class individuals who suffer under those systems of exploitation. And they need, they need to be fought for just as much as anybody else. Um, yeah. Just quickly, um, I think the most important role model to me is my little sister, of all things. And uh, I was the meanest big sister growing up. I used to beat her up and kick her all the time. And she was just constant. She just loved me no matter what. And she taught me that that is the most important thing to do. Be there for people. Love them no matter what. And I think that lesson has taken me really far in life with the people that I care about and, you know, being patient and tolerant and listening and, you know, getting through tough things with people. The most important thing is to really be constant and be there. Okay, awesome. So I've had... I can count on one hand the number of role models I've had in my life. And, you know, one of those, including Roy Montgomery, who worked in CMEI. Um, but the biggest role model that I have had in my life was my mom. She was an independent, strong immigrant Latina woman who was also a single mother who worked so hard to really raise my four, my three brothers and I and really take care of us and really just 
bring us to where we are right now. She passed away last May, and so I try to do whatever I can to continue her legacy in helping raise my little brothers and just really being a good person within the community and showing up and showing out. <laughs> I'm just gonna say thank you, Gabe. Um, you're very inspirational. Um, I appreciate that a lot. Um, my two role models are my parents. In fact, um, neither of them went to college. Um, they both are hard uh, workers. My mom is an immigrant from Mexico, and my dad is just a small business owner that was raised on the streets of Denver. So um, every day um, I'm here, I'm lucky to be in a position of pursuing a college degree because of my parents. Because without their so constant support, uh, without their constant determination, uh, I wouldn't be here uh, where I'm right now. So. I have two very prominent women in my life right now. Uh, both of them are in academia. They're very involved. They're very hard women. Um, one of them, her name is Vedeti Sereda. She uh, is an archaeologist in Mexico. Uh, although CEU was involved in her project, uh, she's out there making sure that indigenous knowledge and remains are being treated as actual knowledge and not just something to be looked at. Um, and then the second one would be Dr. Sheila Ruski here in campus. Um, she is making waves for sure um and i don't know she is just such a hard working being and then also so humane i think that is a very good contrast balance between one person i think it's pretty common to be in the lawless way in today's society in so you guys know where I'm going with this. My mom, uh, Latina, uh, immigrant, same as Gabe's. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about that. I can't imagine. Yeah, it must feel like. So I'm sorry. Yeah. She 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 was cut off from our family because you know the whole situation with immigration and whatnot. And she taught me as a single mother that. If you work hard enough, if you believe in what you want to do, then you will achieve it. So she's my number one. She's always been my number one. Always be my number one. And um, I always can well, she's my uh, you know, my support. She will always be my support. So she's my number one. Thank you. It's so funny when you think about the aspect of a role model and what that entails that puts a lot of pressure on that particular person or that particular whoever. I would say my role model or my role models are those who wake up every day. Those who get up, go to work with a smile on their face, maybe a slight attitude because they don't necessarily want to go to work. But my role model would be everyone on this panel, everyone in this audience and everyone listening. Um, those who have the courage to keep going, those who have the courage to sustain and keep just the mental capacity to survive in this modern day America. Um, so shout out to you uh, for just being flipping awesome. <laughs> You didn't have a good reason to vote for Gabe. You're doing it. Um, I'm I'm real casual. I'm not into the whole westernized professionality thing. So you always catch me talking like from the hood slash down the street at the science department, you know. Um, but ever since I was, I never had a role model. I've been surrounded by drugs and violence and just the the things that come with being surrounded by poverty my entire life. So they always say, don't meet your heroes because they're going to disappoint you. And that is in fact true. Um, until recently, um, I kind of learned that I was first and foremost my biggest inspiration because if you cannot find inspiration within yourself, you are not going to find it within anybody else. As in the four agreements, it does talk about how, you know, we are a mirror and there's this fog between us and that fog is constantly seeing self-doubt and no enlightenment and such and such. But if you see that in yourself, you see that in others. Um, however, I did meet someone recently. Her name is Winona Leduc. My goodness, that woman is an activist. So check her out.
here's the leadership mix. So the next question is, what does advocacy mean, and what does advocacy look like to you? Sorry, I'm just saying you. Okay, so <laughs> advocacy to me is doing, right? Like you're going to talk about it, be about it. So you see something that you want to change. You see something that is, there's a problem. It doesn't matter if you're talking to students. It doesn't matter if you're, um, you know, you're going up and you're coming to these meetings. It's a matter of using your place and your platform to amplify a student's voice, to take the necessary research um, and labor work that it takes to make those changes, or at least try. It doesn't mean you have to be successful. I think being successful in advocacy work is just trying. You're going to continually run into play failures and obstacles, but those obstacles are going to eventually lead you to a small success, and that small success always leaves you with a sense of hope. And I think the advocacy work is just trying and trying to get over these problems that students and people um, constantly run into when it comes to um, elevating or enlightening themselves in whatever sense that may mean to each individual um, or group of individuals. Is this the one minute or two minute response? One minute. one minute. Okay, let's change that. So advocacy to me is something that encapsulates a lot of different realms. Um, but to make it more simplified, I believe that the perfect advocate is someone who reaches you on your level, meets you where you are, and says, this is what we could do to take you from this step to the next step to the next step. Someone that's going to be there with you from the beginning to the end, and furthermore, say, these aren't just my feelings. These are the feelings of those individuals or this particular person that I am here to support. An advocate doesn't look within themselves. They look to who they are supporting for the better good of the not only community, but the person themselves who really help. See, it's about asking questions, questioning, even totally, even internalized. You know how that affects others around you? Advocacy is listening to others and um, assisting them given tools so they can also be accountable and have their own self <laughs> So advocacy to me is self-awareness. I look at all of you all on the planet as little babies, and I treat you all with the utmost care. So I have the demonstration of elevation and I create value in every conversation that I have, giving you the notice that you are the best version of your mother and your father. You better act like it. Hi, Maddie. Um, so advocacy to me is, again, as some of the other representatives referenced, being aware of situations, um, not being afraid to stand up, um, but not just fighting for a cause, but again, listening to the people that you're trying to work for and bring them to the table and amplify the voice as far as a community, not just a single person standing in like a solo leadership position, but someone facilitating the change with a group. So advocacy looks like representing the people around you. That means not just listening to them, but walking in their shoes and breathing their same air every day, something that all of our candidates on this panel do. Um, it looks like listening to, knowing when to listen, knowing when to talk, and knowing when to be skeptical and when to challenge something. A one minute version. I have worked in a number of places and especially overseas in different advocacy roles. I guess that's where it began. Working for a city council, starting a business improvement district like we had with the downtown business partnership, representing different varied interests and advocating on their behalf to change the structure. And so I think when people come to us and say, something isn't right and it needs to change, we listen to that. We then pay attention to how things are structured initially to have a good understanding of that, and then go about talking to the people in charge to see how we can affect change. 
That's very good. For me, after means recognizing that the status quo has got to go. You know, if I could speak for, you know, my team, Jacob and Tom, we see the way that the status quo impacts a lot of students. Uh, you know, we talk about marginalization, people get kind of pushed off into the margins. I see it as oppression, genuine uh, lived concrete things that are finding. Um, and an advocate would recognize that and work to change it, work to transform it into something different, something that serves people instead of crushes people. Uh, you know, that's advocacy. and it's the IDP of transformative advocacy. So I'm actually taking an initiative to build my career on the understanding of advocacy in the sense that it's adding your voice and pace so people can see, quite literally, in the sense that I want to help multiple communities of the marginalized to be understood and reparated with their voices added to the case of situations in a transformation way. All right, guys, thank you all for your responses. It's very good your responses. All right, next question is, SGT SAC is unique in that it is based on the ideals of shared governance. How do you interpret shared governance and how will you continue to work towards those ideals? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> SGT SAC. Is, a, is unique in that it is based on the ideals of shared governance. How do you interpret shared governance and how will you continue to work towards those ideals? Well, I'll give you the first moments. Shared governance, right? So what that looks like to me is understanding other different viewpoints or where people are coming from. Meaning, if you say something that I might disagree with, I still respect that and I'll, you know, allocate my time to try to understand that and not close it off. And I think democracy as, as it stands and what it really means is being able to understand where other people come and bring different viewpoints without them being shunned or closed off completely, you know, because that's the only way we can reach that, that uh, gap of misunderstandings, trying to bring them together and made a halfway point possible. You all are giving some easy questions. Shared government represents to me the old Chinese proverb, seek first to understand, then to be understood. <laughs> so shared governance is, um, inspired uh, by the shared government structure here at MSU Denver, where our faculty, students, and administration all give a voice. But I will say, I think the students here actually represent shared governments a little bit better, because here on um, SGT SEC, um, it is a, it, it, there's 12 diverse minds that, that you got to work with, and you got to um, come together to consensus and agreements. Um, but also shared governance means not being afraid to hold ourselves accountable to uh, no, no action um, and to foster uh, misaction. Um, but um, accountability is very truthful and shared governance and should be brought up. Um, even on this piggyback off the previous question about advocacy, shared governance to me is working with a great team of um, advocates, um, advocating for different viewpoints and different priorities, um, but coming to the table, opening to learn and understand different viewpoints in an empathetic way and learn more than you do in a lot of ways. But again, make sure you take action and work together to come up with new and creative solutions. Okay, so shared governance is, uh, is the reality that we all have different things to contribute in the uh, in the governance of our campus, because it is a wide campus of 40,000 people and plenty enough of a faculty. It's all the words currently to say that it is uh, a shared governance when ABOT refuses to allow elected officials to vote, specifically the student vote. Um, and I will be working directly to change that. 
the moment, switching gears to student wellness is next. What is one critical challenge you two students are facing right now? Um, and if you had no constraints, how would you solve that challenge? And just a reminder, this is your time to speak. So if you really want to go up there, just raise your hand and let the side of the Question is, what is your challenge? Yeah, so what is one critical challenge you think students are currently facing right now? And if you had no constraints, how would you solve that challenge? Students are not myself. That's the other. The students. Actually. Yes. Okay. Right, Ms. Daniel. I believe that one major challenge that every single student here on campus faces is the access to communication, the access to services, and the access to programs that are available on campus. Um, if a student has a particular struggle or a student's having a particular battle, where do I go for this? Who do I seek for this? How do I seek help? I believe, and as a candidate, I'm standing on the platform that these services that we give our money to essentially should do as much equal outreach as the candidates on this TSAC community have done throughout their careers as candidates or throughout their careers on the student government as whole. Each student organization should be responsible for building numbers by going onto campus saying, hey, this is available. Hey, that's available. Hey, we do TSAC meetings this day. We do them this day. We have this program this day. I'm not, or I can't name every single program within the time constraints of this moment here, but that's what we need to see. Every other college campus in America, I've seen that. I want to cut it short. Thank you. <laughs> the number one, the number one question I ask you is, is did you know that you had this uh, benefit or this scholarship or this uh, program that could help you? 99% of the time, I said, no, I didn't. I don't know. Almost told me, or, you know, so awareness, right? Awareness is a big issue on this campus. A lot of students don't know the resources that, they're, that are out there, and I'd like to get those resources as soon as possible to know. Thank you. such a reform is like a private institution you know we still have to get it for a lot of credits at the least um and i think a really big problem is burnout you know for us and for faculty as well um if i could i would um cut the four classes per faculty member and i'll do three and i would make sure that those class the faculty is going to provide students, you know, with the extra help that we need because we are not just like the population of private schools. We're not, we are full-time workers. We are, some of us are parents, not just have other responsibilities outside. So I would love to provide faculty and students with a little more support for just at least the very initial part of their academic careers. Uh, the number one issue that I would like to face or tackle um, on this campus is activation. Um, student orgs and student uh, groups around this campus don't have the resources to fully activate this campus. I fully believe that if you go into college, especially a college like this, where um, we're uh, tr uh, trans in college, a lot of us um, kind of use the RTD systems, a lot of us drive here, uh, we don't live on this campus. Uh, having that group of people, having that group that can support you and get you through college, I think that makes a huge difference to someone who doesn't have that. So um, expanding access, funding just to orgs on campus is a big, uh, a big thing I want to fight for. So. Awesome. Okay, so I think one of the biggest issues is the lack of resources that comes with intersectionality of various identities. OK, and so I think that is up to is the responsibility of the university to really help create bridges to these resources. And in a way from that I would see this happen is increasing housing resources to uh, people who need them, uh, especially like immigrant students who can apply for uh, federal housing aid. Um, and just increasing the amount of resources that come with being somebody who has the, those inter intersecting identities, somebody who might not have the correct people or, or know who to connect to or who to talk to, and really creating that social connectedness to increase the access to resources that students have available. Awesome. You know, there's so many brilliant ideas that are that everyone has said so far. I don't think I can add anything to it except to say, of course, 
touting my major, mental health connection and, and assistance. Really, communication is the key to everything for our students on campus. People aren't getting information. They don't know where to seek it. So we need some kind of streamlined ability to give them that information so they can get help. The biggest issue I see impacting our students is economic. Truly, our students are hitting the wall with crushing student debt, with stagnating starvation wages paid to student workers on our campus. Um, faculty are crushed under the current course load. They've been trying to change for 12 years. So we ought to make those changes, make it make this the university the best university to work for in Colorado. We could do that if we make these changes. Also, we ought to we ought to uh, change the resources we put into building partnerships with the military industrial complex, into building partnerships with our state legislature so that we can bring the level of institutional funding back to what it once was, where students weren't getting crushed under this tuition, crushed under student debt. Um, and really, another person might ask, well, what are you going to pay for that? Are you going to pay for living wages for student workers? Well, administrative uh, administrative pay restructuring. We have people getting rich on our campus while people are hungry on our campus. And that ain't right. I say chalk from the top. I got to agree with my running mate, Paul Nelson. Uh, a lot of our issues stem from financial insecurities. We talk about food insecurity. We talk about housing insecurity, people not being able to get to campus, people not being able to afford campus. It all ties to money. We are currently uh, in an in a economic system that is not allowing us to, uh, to um, get resources. Uh, I don't think that education is a privilege. I think that it's a right and like it would be if I had infinite money, I would give everybody a housing. I'd give everybody food. I'd give everybody uh, the ability to get to campus and get their education because that's important. Yeah, a lot of this is going to sound familiar from what the other uh, candidates are saying. But uh, yeah, I think financial security is a huge problem on this campus for a commuter college of working class. Uh, students mainly, one in three students is facing food insecurity and it's impossible to learn if you're hungry. Uh, if, if you've ever been hungry, you know that. Um, housing, if you don't have a, a stable roof over your head and uh, if that's not near campus, which uh, is essentially impossible in Denver to afford uh, living, living near unless you're working 50, 60 hours a week and then going to school on top of that, it's just uh, unfeasible. So. Breaking down those barriers that are blocking people from coming to school and learning as much as they can and graduating. Again, I agree with most of my candidates about access to resources, academics, or financial stability, personal um, barriers um, to gaining success in MSU as an educational. Um, perspective. Um, but one thing that I have on top of that, and what I've learned for student government as well, is work with this excellent group of people um, because I'm actually already advocating for a piece of the solution that answer of creating a resource app on campus. I am trying to work with the Student Care Center and work up through the Dean of Students um, to help create a resource app that will allow um, students um, also input resources. Because again, knowing I'm the white person in the room, I don't know where I have access to a lot of resources for um, minority populations, but giving them access to share those resources with each other to build at least the access to potential on and off campus resources, um, even if we can't directly fund them. Got distracted for a moment. Um, the question is again, my apologies. What are what is the current challenge that students are facing? Safety. Safety. That's what I was going to say. Um, I am. I believe that safety is a challenge, and I believe that because of the political um, and civil um, temperatures of the of, of people, I want to work with the um, restorative justice coalition to improve methods of. Um, discussion on campus so we can have more peace um, relations between students that have opposing views. Yes. 
um, to try and prevent the atom blocking movement as well as other movements that are happening when they create negative acts of violence and violence. And so I'm afraid of mass shootings, and I hope that we do more to do it back here. What I clearly see on campus is too much cell phone and not enough communication. As a technological genius that I am, I would write an algorithm to say, turn that damn cell phone off and speak to your neighbor. We don't socialize enough. Yes. Appreciated. Switching gears again, this time we're going to focus on student engagement. According to a student survey sent out by the elections team, MSU Denver students overwhelmingly agree on the importance of transparency and accountability within student government. However, results also show that the student body or that the student government does a mediocre job at representing students. In what ways would you utilize your role to ensure that you are accurately representing students and voices are being heard? Go down. Yeah, go ahead. Well, as you all can tell, I'm quite articulate. So the thing about this with students is a lot of times students don't speak up because they don't know their value. I would teach them that they are valuable and I would make sure that I listen to their concerns and make sure that they're heard by the other members on the council because I'm a student too. And I am the liaison between foolishness and elevation. It turns the position to get walking down the corridor of Lawrence. And um, I saw this lady, she was upset. And it's like she was crying and she was kind of walking the other direction while I was walking close to me. And I just like, oh no, the student, she's sad and she's upset. And I see her kind of thing and I was like, oh, no, I'm going this way. Oh, oh. Um, I was like, this close to trying to make her feel better and ask if she's okay at the same time as not trying to be invasive. And I feel like she felt me want to ask her and hope that she's okay in a way. But I also just was too afraid. And I think that's what the problem is. I think that's why people are afraid. Like, you're not like, you're social guys and so on. They're afraid and we hear their voices. And I hope that they talk to us. So my goal is to increase transparency is, well, for one, there's a lot of students on campus who are unaware of student government in general and other populations that are also distrusting of any sort of like governmental body. Um, so I actually want to like reach out to student groups, different students, and I have the privilege of working in the Student Care Center, so I can also hear a lot of different voices. And I want to bring those voices to the table and actually invite them and bring them in to share their stories so we can understand what the actual issues on campus are so that we can address the actual issues versus just what we think are issues. Yeah, I agree with Matthew. I think uh, as the student government, our job is to listen to the students and uh, really go out there and see what issues they're facing, what they want from the student government, and just be the, uh, the bridge between what uh, the students want and making that happen. Um, it shouldn't be us imposing the things we want to do. Uh, it should be the, the mass of the people uh, know what's best for them and, and just push for, push for that one. Yeah, I think that it looks like uh, what we were talking about for advocacy, right? It means being the voice of the students, being understanding the troubles, of their uh, their struggle every day. I remember being a student uh, and coming here, living with my parents, going to classes, going to the gym, going home, and never speaking to. And I think that what that looks like is better communication between uh, between TSAC and uh, 
uh, the students to have our flyers up to let them know in their emails when like what events are happening to push our our uh, groups, our clubs, and to build the community. Uh, when they see efforts like that, they'll definitely trust our transparency better. My running mates Jacob and Tom said it best. I won't, I won't waste some more time. For anyone who has served on CSAC and is serving now, um, I think I can speak for them and say it's really hard to reach students. Faculty finds it hard. The administration at the university finds it hard because we're a commuter campus. And as was said, you know, you come here, you go to classes, and you leave. And so I feel what I've learned over the past year, it's going to be about using the faculty senate working through the instructors who see these students in classes and getting concise, clear messages to them once a quarter, once a semester, you know, not just bombarding them with information so they're overloaded and don't notice it. It's just an idea that I think, you know, we can try in the coming year because we have really tried and it is really hard. So that's not to say let's not stop. Let's keep going. Okay, cool. So I definitely agree with what we said. I definitely also think that, you know, going into the classroom and right and being right there in front of students, right? You know, they're already there, right? And so, you know, just a little information that they, that they can get, you know, a little foot in the door type of thing. But also, right, you know, like right now in student government, we are not as diverse as we could be. Right. And so how can we bring those diversity people, those diverse voices into our spaces? And I think that that could also be uh, to, talking to the identity, identity based organizations like the Black Student Alliance, like the Latinx Student Alliance, going there and asking, you know, what is it that, that they see as critical and seeing how we can partner more with different organizations and different students than just uh, TSAC within itself. I think when I talk about student engagement, when I think about student engagement, I also think about academic engagement. When I talk about this ideal world where professors teach three classes instead of four, I'm talking about giving them a space where they can, you know, full writing clinics, they can hold it, they can teach the study strategies. So students have like tools in their pocket, more tools in their pocket so they can succeed, succeed at them. Um, with that being said, that also involves organizations. Well, like I said, this is a complex uh, relationship between all of us in this uh, school environment, but and there's our numbers and we need to help students to advocate for themselves and empower them within their identities. I think it starts with uh, hello, and how are you doing? Um, uh, student council um, representing all of the issues here. I think uh, every single one of us can connect with the students personally and try to get to what their issues are. And as we put it best, is working through the instructors and professors as well, working through the departments and other student organizations to get the word out and try to bridge that gap between the students and the student council and make sure the word gets out. Thank you. I believe I take a totally different stance on outreach and transparency. I believe that legislation legislation should be drafted on the TSAC committee that requires any organization on campus that receives funding from students be required a certain amount of time each month, each quarter, each semester for outreach. If we aren't going to force their hand and say, hey, if you want your numbers to go up, if you want people to volunteer, you have to get out on campus and do the legwork behind that to get people involved. Shooting an email, shooting a text message on this live here, it, it just isn't enough. It's not enough. We need more activation, more activism, more involvement, and the only way to do that is if we force the hand 
of those that we give these financial services to. That's not going to change until we require it. And I think that's something that we can accomplish on TSAC this coming year. Welcome to you guys' closing statements. Um, you have two minutes for your closing statements. After Bruce, if you guys would like to talk about it. Please remind everybody also that we do have um, uh, elections are happening right now, so make sure that you guys share your QR codes so people get in front of their votes for if you'd like to stuff. Um, so let's start with Marie. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate you letting me talk about my views and my my thoughts on things. And, and what I'd really like to say is I hope I get the opportunity to serve again next year and work with this great group of people so that we can instigate more change. And honestly, another very important thing that I should have said that I think is critical to our role as TSAC is really letting all student organizations know every year that we can support them and fund their work in, in any kind of way, because I think a lot of student organizations don't know that, and there's a number of them on campus. So be more of a support for student organizations. Really try to be a mouthpiece. I love what you said, Nate, about activism. And um, just thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to end with thanks. Uh, thank you to everyone here. I think it's possible. Span of the student government currently and the current uh, counselors and lobby government. I know it's not easy uh, doing what you do. So I don't think we're going to actually And also, also the candidates here. And I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to give me the opportunity to tell you who I am and what I believe in. And just go out and go. You know, it's it's extremely important. It's your right. And you know, take advantage of it because at the end of the day, the people who get elected are gonna be the voices of the council. So go home. Thank you. The question again. It's your closing statement. My closing statement. Just believe that we need change in our involvement. I believe in advocacy as a therapy. It means to be that art therapy, not music therapy. But what the fuck about advocacy therapy? And I'm trying to stop that and press it to my apologies. Um, it's kind of subconscious sometimes, like a habit that's implanted to me. I said right three times. I'm trying to stop writing. It has an application of my prefix. Um, so consistently, however, it's not you know, always a bad thing because it's in the direction. However, um, that's the point that I'm trying to make is that the right is the direction. And the left should share in that direction because it is part of the same body of our government. And we should be fighting people, which is our entire country is part of believe in being purple. I believe in giving the land back to indigenous people. And um, that's true justice to me. Hey, hey, go me. <laughs> <laughs> um, once again, I want to say thank you for this opportunity today to speak to you on a broader level. Um, I want to close by saying when, and this was given to me, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. From this past week of being on campus, posting on social media, using Snapchat as my primary, my primary platform of reaching the masses, I believe I've proven myself to show that I am able to be an advocate and to able activate the voices of those who have chosen me to lead them. So far, I've met none of these other organizations on campus. I haven't seen any organizations on campus other than Convocation, other than Beat the Free Week. That's a problem. And that's a problem that needs and will be 
addressed in the future. If I'm not elected, if I am elected, I continue to continue the activism because we need more voices like myself. We need more voices like Paul. We need more voices like Brent. Voices that are saying, hey, these are issues and we're bringing them to the table and this is how we could solve them. But we cannot do it without your support. We cannot do it without the masses. But the key problem is, where are the masses? If we haven't stepped out onto the campus, if we haven't shaken anyone's hands, if we haven't said, hey, how are you to a person all day because we come to school and go home, that's an issue. And that's an issue that needs to be addressed from here on out. My platform is simple, meeting people, hearing their voices, and relaying the information from those voices to create subsequential change. And that's what I stand on. Once again, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your vote in advance. Thank you so much. Go Roadrunners. Hey, what's up, Uh, yeah, so to, to close, um, yeah, I'd just like to say I've been I've been fighting for the people, fighting for the workers and, and oppressed nationalities and all that for, for years. I'm going to continue that fight, whether I'm elected or not. Uh, but being on the student council will give a little, little more power to, to push that fight further. Thank you. Thank you so much for seeing all of us uh, if elected and giving the opportunity. I, just, I would like to empower every single one of um, to how to even run this. Really take care of that academic identity that they have and give them some support. Nothing has to be perfect. You know, that's what we are. Um, and I just, I just wish for students to know that their voice matters within academia and not only. Yeah. Do something new and get rid of something old and watch how your life gently unfolds. The new thing, have more fruits and vegetables instead of all this candy. We get fat and lethargic, and you're gonna end up getting a degree being tired. So one of the things I'm gonna see is food savers where we suck the oxygen out of the little bags and we'll give out fresh fruits and vegetables. Cause when you eat healthy, you talk healthy, you are healthy and things get done. Okay. I wanted to come up to uh, to say that I'm number one. I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Number two, I'm not just representing my campaign today. Uh, there's a reason why there's three heads on the poster. Um, I'm standing alongside uh, Jacob Marshall and Paul Nelson. That's because we are ground shakers. We we make a movement. We are uh, we represent your rights. We want to fight for your resources. So thank you. Yeah, great. So in my social work education, one thing that we're taught is to meet our clients where they're at. So I want to, again, reach out to the admission of our students and again bring them to the table. Um, but I also want to work with the like, movers and shakers over here. Um, and honestly, I would love to be a part of the council with everybody here, because um, whether I agree with everything they say or not, I think we can make a lot of positive change. And I want to work with in the capacity of what's known as servant leadership. So again, I want to fill the space and amplify the voices of students on campus to help let them shine. First and foremost, I just want to thank everyone uh, here uh, online and in the audience for giving us the time and space to voice our opinions and um, it convince you guys how we're going to change the campus. I also am very appreciative to hear uh, the diverse opinions on the stage, um, but uh, I want to bring back um, being student government rap is about the students. Uh, the students are the number one. You go into work every day, uh, you go into the office every day, and you figure out how you're going to represent the students. And I'm excited to continue that fight, to continue the work that I have 
been doing this last year and I'm excited to uh, empower our student organizations on campus and let's get the campus back to where it was before the pandemic. Oh. Thank you. I'm here because I believe students have power. Student power, it's a, it's a magnificent force that can't be stopped by anything on this planet. And when united and exercised consciously, we can really do some things. We can really change things. I'm proud to be up here with a lot of conscious students and Benny, my co my co runners here, John, and the rest of you, honestly. Um, I think a lot of times on our campus, student power is exercised unconsciously. When students transfer out, they're dissatisfied or they can't get their needs met here. When students drop out, that power is exercised unconsciously and it takes the resources that our university needs to continue. Um, what I'd like to do with the rest of these conscious students on stage, if elected, the team here as well, is exercise some of that conscious student power in organizing students to really realize they're not just a person walking through these balls. You're a student that has power, power to change things, power to see the way things are, a fresh out of eyes um, on an old system, on an old status quo, right? And, and the power to, to join with organized faculty in making these changes that really needed to be made a long time ago, but could be made now. We can keep skipping kicks down the road for a lot of different changes that need to be made. And so I'm really excited for this new year, and I, I hope you'll vote for me. I hope you'll vote for my running mates, Tom and Jacob. Uh, they'd, they'd be really good representatives, along with a lot of people here on this on this panel. And so um, I'm optimistic. I maintain an optimism about the future. Yay. Let's stop right here. Awesome. So first, thank you to the audience, virtual in person. Thank you for giving all of us the opportunity to share our stories and for you all of you to get to know what we're about and all that fun stuff. Thank you to our amazing and beautiful moderators and our elections team as well. And I'll close with this. Like Paul said, we as students have power. And sometimes we don't recognize what that power is. And and we are the heart and soul of this university. This university wouldn't be here if it wasn't for us. And so it's up to us to really demand our needs and wants so it can be heard by the administration, by the faculty and staff who have the biggest say, right? Because they control the rules and all that. But again, we have the biggest influence. And yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for coming out and you are sharing that with the students. So hopefully they will see that. Um, the recording will be sent to the election team. So if you like that recording, just reach out to the chat. Um, but thank you so much and have a great night. Awesome. Wait, everyone, I have three uh, on set. Uh, so, grab one from set. Okay. 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 Okay